uh, this kind of continues the conversation we had over too many drinks last night at a hotel. Um, and uh, and I, I'm almost sorry we covered so much, but we, so I'm going to try to narrow this down to two broad topics that are of interest here. Um, one is one is privacy or privacy uh, in English, <laughs> and, uh, um, and the other is open source and 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 free software. Uh, and I'm go I'm going to be the privacy guy, and I'm going to be fairly brief because I I think the sum of what Simon has to talk about is so fascinating and deep and interesting, and I'm more <laughs> interested in that <laughs> than in anything else. So I want to sort of hijack this for that person's purpose. So I'm going to I'm going to start out just by saying a few things uh, uh, about privacy and why it's an issue. Uh, first, uh, our the parent company of of both um, Linux Journal and and Freenode and some others represented here uh, is London Trust Media, and if you go to London Trust Media's website. Uh, you'll see that it's it's basically about privacy. That's the that's the the core principle behind the company. It's what it really believes in, and it's for individuals. Um, and uh, and private internet access, which is their VPN, um, is also about that. And most of the conversation about privacy that you're going to read is really from the point of view of corporations and governments. It's not from the point of view of individuals. And so what I'd like to posit here, and we can bring it up in questions later, or we don't have to if we don't want to, but it will be in a manifesto that we're writing right now. Uh, it's on a wiki on, on the London Trust Media site. Uh, it's pretty close to done. Uh, I'm the primary author of it. But the, the novel thing that we're saying there is that the, the natural world didn't come with privacy, and neither did the Internet. Neither did the digital world. And these are two very different worlds. One has been with us for the duration. The other has been with us really for about 23 years. And we had to invent privacy in the natural world. And we did it with technology. The technology we did it with, the two technologies we did it with, were clothing and shelter. All of us right now are wearing privacy technology. And what followed that in the natural world, after we learned to skin animals and weave clothes, was norms about how we respected the signals that gave to each other. We didn't just wear them for warmth, we wear them to conceal, we would wear them to selectively disclose. And after the norms came the laws. And it was that, it, it, ideally that's how things proceed. You start with tech, you get norms around the tech, and then you get laws respecting the tech. What happened in the, in the digital world is we are still walking around naked. It is still Eden here. We have VPNs, we have onion routing, we have crypto. These are really fairly primitive things in the fullness of time that we need to pass through before we get the norms and we get the laws we need. Instead, what we got was laws. And the most well-known one right now is the GDPR. And I will tell you that I think the GDPR's consequences on the whole have been negative. It has made the internet experience much harder, the web experience much harder. It is given because, it, because of the way it's written. There are only three entities that matter, data controllers, data um, uh, subjects, which are you and me, and data processors. Okay, And even though it says in the GDPR that a data controller can be a natural person, the natural person it imagines, according to every lawyer we've talked to about that, is in fact an intermediary, meaning if you want to shake hands in a GDPR compliant way, you're wearing somebody else's glove, some corporate entity's glove. You have no power. It's here to protect you because you're a victim and you have no control. And that's not right. And that's a problem. And what it's caused on the, because of the way it's codified and because of the way it's followed so far and because of the way that all the lawyers and all of the big corporations that are selling companies ways to be GDPR, GDPR compliant is you put up a cookie notice and say you consent to the use of our cookies to improve your experience. And not saying that part of that experience improvement um, deal that you're accepting when you click accept um, is to be followed with trackers just like you always were, only now they have a fig leaf. They have an excuse to say, no, we got consent. We got consent to, to using cookies. Saying you use cookies on a website is like saying you use molecules. It's, it's completely ridiculous, but that's the norm right now, and we have to fight that along with, with other things. So 
The manifesto of writing starts with saying privacy is personal before it's normative and before it's regulatory. And we still have to work this out. But what matters most is that privacy is personal. So I'll leave it at that. And if we have questions about it, we can go to them later. But I want to go to... Well, let's, let's, let's pick you up on that, okay. Doc. So, All right. so uh, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of, what, of the research that Dana Boyd did yeah. on, on the way that young people deal with technology. And f the way that she always seemed to frame uh, privacy was in the context of agency. Right. She was never talking about the, the information. She was always talking about the people and right. their agency in controlling who could know the information about them. Uh, do you think that GDPR has got anything at all to contribute to a world that, that's about human agency rather than about inoculating corporate greed? Well, it, 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 the GDPR focuses on data. Mm -hmm. And we are hyper-focused, we, I mean, we in the broadest sense, hyper-focused on data because our data or data about us, metadata, um, has been harvested wantonly and is at the base of an awful lot of the wealth that's being created in the right. world today and the services that many of us wouldn't do without because they come from Google and Facebook and other companies. But age, she's absolutely right. Agency is the issue. Agency is the, the power we have to act with effect in the world. When we tie our shoes, we are acting with agency. When we speak to each other, we are acting with agency. We expect to be in control of that. And it doesn't, and by focusing on data, I think it's a gigantic red herring, mm -hmm. um, and, and the GDPR has made it worse. There are lots of companies, and thank you, thank you. Uh, I, but there are lots of companies that are, that are going into the business now. If you can sell your data, they're taking it for free. It's all about dealing you into yes. a completely, cor you know, geez, your house is being ripped off all the time. Why don't you just sell the shit in your house? Yep. I mean, that's kind of what it's about. And, but she's absolutely right. Agency is the issue, and I think Pushing agency, personal agency, is one of the causes that we have as a community right now. Yes. But, uh, so I see this. Uh, some of the work that I'm doing uh, in Europe at the moment is around the copyright directive change, uh, which its authors call reform and I would call corruption. Um, th and the copyright reform is, is leading us into a place where uh, large corporations are being empowered to censor the work of individuals. Mm -hmm. And I think this is going to be hugely damaging to the free and open source software community because we're constantly dealing with interactions with copyrighted materials. And we're, we're about to be treated to a world of uncertainty that can only be resolved by caution. Uh, and that's where the copyright directive comes from. And it seems to me that GDPR is the same world. It's, it's all about ad advantaging large corporate engagement with data and basically treating citizens as... as uh, 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 I don't know, as a raw ingredient, as a, you know, we, we, are, we are the mincemeat that is going in to make the sausages. And uh, that worldview seems to be behind the, co the copyright directive changes. It seems to be behind GDPR. Uh, and uh, that seems to me to be one of the biggest challenges facing the world of free and open source software at the moment, is the, the tendency now that we have become so uh, widely adopted to be treated as an industrial product rather than as individuals with rights and freedoms. Uh, there are a couple of ways we could go with that. What, what I'd really love to see, what you just said appended to the first talk this morning about copyright and going all the way back with that, because in many ways we've ratcheted. You got that, Chris? Yeah, yeah, Chris Lamb, he's up there somewhere. Okay. Um, we've, we've ratcheted starting in whenever it was um, in, in this general direction that at the dawn of the industrial age, um, Walt Whitman in Song of Myself, which might as well have been part of the free software mm -hmm. movement, um, uh, that he said, I could turn and live with the animals. They are so placid and self-contained. And he goes through a whole bunch of things that animals do that we don't. But he ends up by saying, not one of them is demented with the mania of owning things. And what we have in the digital world is a lot of stuff that just doesn't work with ownership. Yeah. Th Thomas Jefferson, you know, in his letter to Isaac McPherson said, there is nothing in the combustive power of an idea that makes us subject to property. If I, if I have an idea and I share it with you, we both have it now. It's not something you even want to have turned into property. And when you do, 
you've created an artificial system for constraining everything that can be done with it, including out in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And a, a, an interesting thing to me from early on in, in my own dealings with the open source and the free software world before that is that what it has or what J.P. Rajaswamy and I, when he was uh, uh, at BT, uh, called because effects. You make money because of it, not with it. Yes. You know, there, there's, you know, you make money because of language. You make money because of, of the opposable thumb. You don't make money with it. You don't say, I'm going to charge you for my opposable thumb. I, I have it. And I can use it, right? So, so how do, so what would you do? I mean, I, I mean, is that a, mm. a lost fight? Is that a separate fight? Do is it the kind of thing that we just put up with? And well, well I, I think we were making great progress with with free software up mm. until the the uh, the invention of the word cloud in connection with yeah. computing, and ever since then, because because the 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 cloud takes away my agency to uh, to control the software in front of me, we've, as a movement, tended to just push it away and say, no, d just don't use that. Yeah. You know, there's that great uh, uh, FSFE slogan, there is no cloud, just other people's computers. And, and that, that, that leads us to say, the only good cloud is a cloud I don't use. And, and because of that, we have stayed out of any attempt to talk about what cloud freedom looks like. Uh, um, I don't believe we have a general consensus on what software freedom looks like in an era of cloud. And because of that, we're left helpless by the, the reptilian instincts of corporate uh, greed, deciding that cloud means centralized computing and that cloud means proprietary software. Uh, it, it's, the software is proprietary in fact, even though every line of code is actually free software in, in practice. It's only open source and free up to the point where it gets deployed by the cloud provider. And beyond then, there's no freedom for anybody. And we've allowed this world to come into existence where, where we are, once again, a consumable product rather than individuals with agency. And, uh, and I, I think one of the big challenges facing the free software movement at the moment is to, is to grasp the question of what, what, do we, what is freedom in the cloud? And I, I, I think it looks well, a lot freedom. like a distributed solutions. And I think it looks li a lot like interoperable solutions. And I think it looks a lot like um, m guaranteeing the agency of individuals over their data. It's also substitutable, right? So, so for example, and we talked about this last night, um, uh, I operated, we, I have a server called, Sur it then has an IP address, but Searles.com, my surname is, there's a pile of files on there. There's nothing terribly important, but there it is. And, um, and I operated our, um, our email on that, an SMTP server and an IMAP server. And um, at a certain point, the spam problem, even with Spam Assassin, became too hard to handle. I didn't ever want to put it on Google. So we were friends with Rackspace, and we have a Rackspace, it's on a Rackspace cloud. But the, the substitutable nature of that is I can yank it all off, and I can put it somewhere mm -hmm. else. It's mine. It, in, in a way, it's just... It's not storage because it's more active than storage. If something goes wrong, there's somebody I can call. But I think substitutability is a, is a key part of this. I know a lot of companies that are on the, on the, Ada, uh, on the Amazon cloud, or whatever it's called right now. Is that AWS? It could general? be a AWS. Yeah, yeah. but in, in the AWS world where they get lots of analytics on that, right? Mm -hmm. And some of that analytics is fairly intrusive. Um, but... And I don't know whether they can substitute that or not, but it brings up something Brian Bellendorf, who's the alpha father of Apache, uh, and now runs the Hyperledger uh, project for the Linux Foundation, calls minimum viable centralization. And I think there's a, there's a corresponding reciprocal of that, which is maximum viable, not just decentralization, but distribution. Mm -hmm. We are all distributed as human beings. I'm not a decentralized entity as as a terminal on some decentralized yes. something you're very centralized i it's unfortunately yes yeah, you know yeah. but but the but the but we all are yeah. we are all autonomous beings and 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 people forget that what we what we really do need is that distributed imperative fully respected but in ways that people can take one look at it and say i want that mm -hmm. right we had that moment in the late 90s when lots of people 
for the first time saw, wait a minute, I can run my own email server. I don't even need an ISP maybe. I mean, maybe I've, I can operate my own everything. And I think that was a lot of why Linux grew the way it did. I mm -hmm. think that was a lot of our readership with Linux Journal. It was hack your own everything. Um, but at a certain point, it became easier just to use other people's stuff. Uh, you mentioned Linux Journal there. Um, you told me a story earlier about how Linux Journal got its name. I, I, and I, I, I think, yeah, uh, yeah, it's so, yeah, I it's think an people would be interested it to hear. It is, it is an interesting thing. So Phil Hughes, who's the father of Linux Journal, um, uh, contacted me and a small coterie of other people in the early 90s because he wanted to start a free software journal. And he called it that, a free software journal. And, uh, and I don't remember, because nobody has the records of this, whether or not RMS was in on that. Of course, he didn't like whatever it was Phil wanted to do. Um, but, but at the same time, what, what happened was in, out of nowhere, Phil declared an end to the conversation and said, it's going to be Linux Journal because there's this Finnish kid. You know, there's, uh, there's this Finnish kid. He's doing this cool version of Unix. He really, Phil really liked it, but he saw Linux as the, f the free software, the free Unix operating system that was going to succeed in the long run. Phil was really good at betting based on his knowledge of that kind of thing. He'd been, he'd, his business was distributing, or not distributing, selling these, these uh, cheater cards basically for VI, for Emacs, for one kind of Unix or another, um, and, and just selling those. He was sort of like a, a micro O'Reilly because these things were just one sheet. And, um, uh, but he saw Linux as, gonna, as, as the success there. But one reason, and we talked about that too, was that it used the GPL. Yes. Well, I, I think they're using the GPL for, uh, a, a, to create a, uh, a level playing field for contributors is, is a crucial thing to do. So I, I unpack a, that a for package. us because... Uh, well, I, you know, I think that uh, if, you're, if what you're dealing with is componentry, you probably need to pick a license that is maximally compatible with all the other licenses of the places where your componentry is going to end up. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you're creating a piece of software where you want a lot of people to collaborate, um, if you use a, 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 a non-reciprocal license, once you create a viable product, it's very straightforward for somebody to come along and freeload, take it, productize it, take it away. And when you use a reciprocal license, that can't happen uh, because everybody in the project has got a duty to respect the reciprocal terms. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think the GPL was crucial for what Linux became. It was also very important. So I'm, uh, Crystal didn't mention it. I'm also on the board of the Document Foundation. Uh, we make LibreOffice. Uh, I was also at some microsystems then involved in OpenOffice for many years. And uh, I picked using the GPL v3 for OpenOffice. Uh, before that, we'd been using a non-reciprocal license and IBM was freeloading. Mm. They were taking OpenOffice, and they, were, they called it Lotus Symphony, and they were giving it away free, and they weren't contributing to the community in any way. They were simply, they were doing their, their cool stuff inside. And that was undermining all the commercial contributors to OpenOffice, because they would put in these cool new features, and then suddenly they'd show up in Lotus Symphony. And uh, no one had a motivation to contribute, because there was a freeloader who would simply leech the code away. Uh, when we changed the license to GPL v3, IBM immediately became a supporter of the community. So distinguish between v3 and v2, because Linux <laughs> made the decision to stick with v2, with, yeah, with but Linux, but partly for legacy reasons. So that's definitely a John S uh, topic, where, wherever John is. John can distinguish between those. I, I would simply yeah, say that, that the, I'd say that GPL v3 uh, handles the realities of corporate engagement with, with the GPL much more cleanly and literally than the GPLv2 does. In the GPLv2, all the, the corporate behaviors to do with patents, to do with uh, the, uh, co the secret crypto, are all handled implicitly. And th one of the things that um, all open source licensing does is it makes everything uh, as certain as possible for the developer. So that as a developer, I can be sure that I have the right to use the software for any purpose, to understand it, to improve it and to share it with anyone I want. Mm -hmm. And GPLv2 in the corporate world 
there was too much interpretation. There was too much of a need to go and ask a, a corporate lawyer. And I think GPLv3 makes explicit mm. the patent protections, the, the anti-TIVOization, the, the use of crypto and so on. Anti-TIVOization. Yes. But uh, th that this, we're definitely into John's, okay. D right, John Sullivan's territory here. That's good. So I'll ask you something that we didn't talk about yet. All right. Um, I remember when um, it was clear that Apple's legacy OS had run out of gas and that Apple was likely to go with with Linux or something or one of the B or a BSD mm -hmm. as as the base level OS they chose FreeBSD um, one reason one supposition about the reason for that was they just didn't want to be beholden to Linux and the whole Linux thing and uh, b but another might be just that it was a more advantageous license. And I'm wondering what your thoughts on that were, <laughs> if, any, if you have any. Well, I'm uh, sure you do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so one, one of the things I, I, I look back to is the fact that um, the free software movement arose from two trunks, not from one. Mm. Um, there was a West Coast trunk where Bill Joy in 1977 started collecting tools around AT&T Unix. And because of the restrictive terms of AT&T Unix, gradually started writing more and more replacements for Unix until in the early 80s he had a complete u operating system, which, was, which, was, which is where BSD yeah, came from. Happened, yeah. uh, and uh, uh, contemporaneously with that on the, west, on the East Coast, the, the, the group of hackers in, in MIT was uh, discovering that, the, that because of the IBM consent decree, uh, uh, the software was now being monetized separately to hardware and they weren't being supplied with the source code anymore. And they were evolving from that a response to how source code ought to be dealt with. And I think the, the East and West Coast philosophies are actually subtly different from each other. I think the West Coast philosophy is a philosophy that says, we're all smart here, let's just stay out of each other's hair. And the, the East Coast philosophy is, uh, I have a right to uh, agency in my software and we need to perpetuate that right to agency so that all of us can carry on uh, controlling our own worlds. So and Apple was with West Coast. And I think Apple was... Is they, were, they were with Tupac. Uh, Apple is solidly yeah. a West Coast company, and I think that their preference will always be to be in a world where they're not beholden to anybody, where they're, they, you know, they're doing cool stuff, they're going to do their cool stuff. They do do open source. They do, re they do, s they do release some code back into the wild uh, below the UI level. Mm -hmm. um, they're still they're still doing cups, uh, however however we feel about the way they're handling it, um, but their instinct is always a BSD-ish instinct of saying, look, you know, I'm doing my stuff, and I, you just stay out of my out of my out of my hair. You know, here's my great code. Do what you want with it, but don't bother me. And, and Apache is the same. And a, Apache is just a, a a patent protected version of the same thing. It's here's my code. Don't bother me. Oh, and by the way, I'm not going to bother you with patents. So. Something you said earlier, and I think you said you got it from Bruce Perens, is that in the history of open source, open source um, was essentially a, um, uh, a way to promote free software. Yes. Well, so so um, I asked Bruce about this, because uh, Bruce is back involved with OSI again now, helping with, this, um, with the, the European Union's push to allow patents in standards which I think is a terrible, terrible thing to happen. And Bruce is helping us push back against all of that. Uh, there is a very well-funded campaign by the mobile industry, and particularly one chip vendor in the mobile industry, to get the European Union to favor standards that allow um, standards, essential patents within the standard. And Bruce is helping me push back on that. Mm -hmm. So I asked Bruce, you know, uh, where did open source come from? And he, he said that open source is simply a marketing campaign for free software. It, it arose in an environment where um, th a group of people had just seen Netscape being put out of business by Microsoft and had tried to liberate the code that was in uh, all of Netscape's assets. And they discovered that when you go talk to business people about free software, they mishear you. The first thing they do is mishear you. They think that you're asking them to do things for free. And uh, that group of people decided that if we were ever going to see uh, software freedom aided and assisted by the commercial world, we needed to use a different word for free software. And so the, they, they coined the term open source. 
it was all pretty good for the first six months or so. And then there were some serious personality disputes that arose that led to a, a division between the two communities. Now, I, for me, today, I don't believe there is any reason and why we should tolerate that division continuing to exist. Um, I, I believe that, uh, that for most people, free software is uh, open source software, and open source software is free software. Yes, there's corner cases that we can obsess over, mm -hmm. but, but fundamentally, we've all got a common problem of a United States and a European Union trying to take away our agency over software. And we don't need to be fighting each other over That's it. We right. need to be fighting the, 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 the corporatized legislators who are trying to take away our agency. Um, whether we favor an agency that calls itself open source or an agency that calls itself free software is not going to matter to the European Union when they make it impossible for us to run a community under either name. Wow. Yeah, exactly. That's fantastic. I hope somebody transcribes that. <laughs> I, uh, it, was, it was perfect. I love how he speaks in final draft. It's just, it's very helpful. Um, so, how many licenses does the Free Software Foundation have versus the Open Source <laughs> Initiative? Well, uh, so OSI doesn't and have. Why? And why? So OSI doesn't have any licenses. Okay, but it um, sanctions. So, so OSI and FSF are very different creatures. Yeah. So the FSF is a center of expertise and competence on software freedom, mm -hmm. whereas OSI is a a group of people who steward a process of determination around licenses, and then when it appears to reach consensus, we crystallize that consensus, and we make a record of the conclusion. And so, you, whereas you can go to the Free Software Foundation and say, you know, t tell us whether this interpretation of the GPL is true, and they will happily tell you that because th their people in the FSF wrote the GPL, more than that, they are an ex a center of expertise on software freedom and on uh, th that particular license. At OSI, the board of directors are all going to look at each other and try and work out whether we share an opinion. And mm. well, we, we, we tend to agree with each other quite a lot, but we're not really a center of exper excellence and expertise on the minutiae of the legal issues of licensing. Mm -hmm. We're rather a group of people that on behalf of the community remembers the consensus so that we don't have to have that argument again. And so that the organizations are quite different so from that So it memorializes a bunch of agreements that are, that are yeah. Now a much more interesting question is how, more how many licenses the world needs. Yeah. And um, I, I, I'm not sure that we need any more licenses uh, in the world. Uh, I routinely. It's like moral precepts. How I, many moral precepts? I, 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 well, I routinely yeah. say to people that you know we have this process for approving new licenses, and I uh, and I'm really begging you not to use it uh, because we don't want to approve any more licenses. Mm -hmm. um, but we do eventually find ourselves in a place where we have to do that from time to time. Uh, but if you look at the, the 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 spectrum of open source licenses, there's only about six of them that are used at any scale. Uh, mm -hmm. All the rest are satisfying somebody's ego. You know, they're under some company's name, or they're satisfying somebody's desire to have their amateur lawyering memorialized. And so, so OSI doesn't really have many more licenses than the FSF does. It's the, the main difference is the FSF's licenses are all reciprocal, whereas the OSI has some licenses that are also non-reciprocal. And the world's a complicated place, right? I mean, yep. and, and, and I think an awful lot of what we do, and probably some of you with open laptops here are doing it right now, is debugging code, right? Yeah. And rewriting That's what code. I would be doing if, we, if I was yeah, sitting listening to us talking. So, so, I mean, it's so funny looking down from the top and seeing all these guys working on code. Yeah. You know, at, at most conferences, what you're seeing is somebody, you know, doing their email or looking at Facebook or something. So this is, that's encouraging, actually. But th the reason I bring it up is because I want to touch on something else you brought up last night that's a little off this topic, which is blockchain. All right. Um, <laughs> and uh, because w what you have to say about it or think are currently thinking about it is a little bit uh, out of the mainstream, but I think is really important. Um, and it has to do with the same thing, that the world's a complicated place and we need to rewrite some things and we need to change some things. And by putting something in a immutable form, 
you have a problem with that. Yep. You want to unpack well, that it's, it's not so much blockchain that is a problem, although yeah. I, am, I am something of a blockchain skeptic. Um, I'm not quite as extreme as David Gerard, who wrote, if you, there's an, a, a, an excellent and uh, provocative book called Attack of the 50-Foot Blockchain, uh, mm. which I suggest you download and read. But um, I'm not, so I'm not as extreme as David, but no. I, I have a particular thing about smart contracts. Uh, because to start with, they use that word smart, which you also see in smart devices. And the S, it's actually an acronym, and the S stands for security risk. In, in, whenever you see the word smart, that's what the S stands for. Uh, and it's, you know, so in, in, in smart devices in the home, every one is a, is a, a little nest of malware waiting to be exposed. Um, and uh, when it comes to blockchain, uh, smart contracts, you know, it, if you think about what a smart contract is, it's some programmer using an unfamiliar new programming language who has written a piece of software that he warrants is bug-free and he's so confident that it's bug-free that he's happy to have it executed automatically and for the source code to remain immutable down all time. And, um, I, you know, I, I, I struggle with having a piece of highly empowered immutable software that is written once and can't be updated. Uh, that, that strikes me as being kind of risky. It, I don't know. it doesn't have versioning built into it? In well, some well way the, you know, you have this discussion with the Ethereum community and they'll explain to you how you can do substitutions in there. But smart contracts seem to me to be a great way to make security crises just sit n lurking in everyone's business, waiting to be exposed by a backdoor or an exploit that you can't rapidly respond to because it's in a smart contract and not in a piece of source that you can shut down. A whole lot of unaffordable <laughs> stuff in there. <laughs> I hope so. And that's me in trouble with so, the entire blockchain community. Now. So let's throw this open now to the to the to the audience um, that isn't really an audience. Um, uh, the, I'm sure some people have some questions. I don't know if there's a floating mic or not. If there isn't, make them sure. Is, so is Nathan up there with a, them. with a floating mic? Here he he's going to bring your mic down. So we okay. don't have to paraphrase your Did question. You have your hand up over here. This, this gentleman over here with yeah. a glorious red beard. <laughs> uh, that one. Uh, what are your thoughts on the common? Clause I'm not there? sure. I can hear you. Yeah. Is it on? It's on. Go, uh, go, there what, it is. go for it. Yeah. What's your thoughts on the common clause license that Redis recently used in terms of like cloudy things? Still wondering. Well, it's not open. So the question there is, what am I thought? What are what are our thoughts? Uh, or maybe we'll turn to no, you first. Yeah. You. Uh, are yeah. on the on the common clause license. Um, I, I think that uh, first of all, it's not open source, and I don't think it's possible to make it open source as conceived. Uh, I think that it's very unfortunate the way that it was uh, named and released. Uh, I think those make it very difficult to therefore have the necessary conversation that lies beneath, uh, which is that um, uh, there is the, 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 cl the cloud era has created some new opportunities for free riding. Uh, and because of the way the cloud industry has come together with concentrated power in, in the hands of individual companies, they are feeling horribly threatened, by, particularly by AWS. Uh, and consequently, they want to th they want to do something to protect themselves. They're sitting there cowering un uh, the, under the fear of the code that they have um, taken a great deal of investors' money to write, suddenly being rendered unmonetizable by being put on AWS for free. Uh, and so I, th I think that where it's coming from is quite understandable. I think that as a as a as a license, I think it's highly re highly regrettable. Uh, because it, its whole concept is to be used as a modifier to existing open source licenses. And who knows what the legal consequences are of combining those terms with arbitrary license A. Who, who, no, one, no one knows. No one has thought it through. No one has done the analysis to decide what Commons Clause and Apache do, and that was, that was what Redis actually tried to use. Who knows what happens when you stick it alongside uh, the Eclipse license, for example. How will the clauses, how will the terms work with each other? What games will be created? Um, so I, I think it's, 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 it's a bad approach to licensing to create modifiers like that. I think it's bad the way it was named because it created confusion. 
I think the underlying pain the companies feel is real and there needs to be a conversation about it. I think that conversation could well go along the lines of, well, what do you think you're doing creating a single product company in an era when we have realized that collaborative development works better? Um, and I, I think that the, that's the, for me, that's where the real conversation is. I think single product companies are going to get rarer and rarer in the world of free and open source software. Uh, I think that if your whole, the, 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 and the reason for that is because there is only one business model. People say there's loads of them, but there's only one business model. The one business model is I will give you what is, what is uh, plentiful to me and, and scarce for you in return for what is plentiful for you and scarce to me. That's the only business model there is. And to make that work with open source software, you have to somehow make the open source software plentiful to me and scarce to you. And that is inherently impossible because the license makes it plentiful to everybody. And so business, any business model that depends upon the scarcity of the code is going to fail unless you artificially restrict the availability of the code. And so what's inevitably going to happen with any single product company as we understand and become more sophisticated is they're going to be unable to monetize it because they're going to be unable to make it, make it scarce. So I think we'll see single, single product companies going away, and that's the real story behind Commons Clause. It's Redis discovering that the world no longer favors single product companies and that they've got to do something about it. And, and also what, what makes a company valuable is not the plentitude of its property, but of its talent also. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's in that exchange you're talking about. I mean, you look at a Red Hat, for example, that just sold for a pile of money to IBM for reasons most of us don't know, but you can probably guess better <laughs> than anybody. Right. They but don't talk to me anymore, strangely. Okay, yeah. well, I, but, my, but my point <laughs> is, um, is, is that um, uh, they attracted talent. They yes. attracted talent because of the plentitude of code and because of their orientation to code. Um, because we're competent in business, right? So, and so you're hiring competencies on the, on the seller's side and not necessarily code. I mean, there's a, um, J.P. Ragaswamy and I came up with this when, I, uh, when he was the chief scientist at BT and I consulted them for a few years, that uh, with open source and free software, you make money because of it, not with it. Mm -hmm. um, and, that, and we call those because effects. You mm -hmm. make, and because effects are very hard for people to get in business often to get their he head around because they think, well, well how can I, what, nobody says, you know, because you have water and toilets in your business that you can make money off of those things. You know, yeah. you don't want to make pay toilets in there. Well, Unless you're running. I want to, yeah, I want to monetize our, our, our lose. It makes no sense. But anyway, other questions? Unfortunately. We're out of time. We're out, oh no. Anybody have any time they want to sell us up here? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. That's great. To Thank see you, you very much. Nice to see you. Good. Absolutely. Thanks.